Okay, thank you very much indeed. This is a good photograph for us to um, start our journey here today. I do want you to think of this as a journey, it's not a, a lecture. I want you to participate in this journey with me. And um, the first thing I want you to do is to dive into this photograph and imagine that that is you. Imagine that little figure standing at the foot of that mountain. Imagine how it would feel to stand at the bottom of an amazing mountain and look up and imagine the risk, imagine the challenge, imagine the incredible things you're going to experience. Sometimes these, these expeditions can be 10 weeks away from all your friends, 10 weeks away from home. You're going into a very challenging, dangerous environment, and it's a fascinating experience. Now, this is an experience that I have had about 40 times in my life. I've been very fortunate to make films uh, for National Geographic Channel and Discovery Channel and the BBC. Very interesting work, uh, at the same time quite challenging work. Um, and I wonder if you can imagine emotionally how you would feel if that was you. Put yourself in the, sh the, the shoes of that person, the boots of that person. Imagine it's you standing in that moment. Put up your hands and tell me, how do you think you would feel emotionally in that moment, standing at the bottom of a big mountain? What would be the emotions you would have? Put up your hands, please. So, let's go. Who's going to start? Someone's going to start? Yes. I'll feel, in, I'll, I'll feel intimidated. Intimidated, yes. Okay. By, the, by what? By the, how big everything yeah. is. The scale of the environment and the dangers of it. Yes, how about you? Probably a bit overwhelmed. Overwhelmed, yes. Yeah, a good one. Yeah. Cold. Cold? Nice <laughs> one. So, yeah. There's a lot more logic to that, you may think. Over this side, who's got another one? We've had intimidated, overwhelmed, cold. What else would you feel? What would you feel? Yes. Excited, very good, yeah, because that excitement is important. Uh, you need to be excited about the whole challenge, that's true. Um, what else in, in connection with the scale of the environment? What would you feel in connection with your relationship with the environment? I'd be amazed. Amazed, yeah, absolutely. And then? I would feel small. Small, yes, I was looking for that, small. Because you feel like a little dot, a little atom in this place. Now, my job, um, I've been really lucky to have an amazing job. Uh, making films for Discovery Channel and National Geographic Channel and the BBC. It's been really interesting work. It came from my own passion in climbing and adventure. And that started through reading. Uh, there was no other reason. Uh, basically, I started reading books when I was about 12 or 13 years old. And what I want is for this session to make you even more passionate about reading and uh, even more positive about, about the fact that books can change your lives in a positive way. And they did for me, I became a great reader of mountaineering books, some true stories about climbing, and that changed my whole life, and it, it showed me who I was. And the same may be true for you, so I want you to explore the world of books, as wide a range of books as you can, because it will teach you about yourself and what you love, uh, which is a really interesting thing. So I've had uh, some amazing opportunities to go all around the world. Uh, I've filmed in, in virtually every continent. And this year, I was lucky enough to have an opportunity to go back to Mount Everest. I've been there several times, the highest mountain in the world, and uh, it's a really extraordinary place. Now, I thought I'd show you some little video clips uh, about that journey, because uh, in addition to the writing I do, as you know, I am actually a filmmaker. Uh, so, let's go to those and have a look and see what it was like to uh, make a journey up there. Hopefully, we'll find these clips here. Here we go. Uh, so, this, was, this is how your journey to Everest begins by flying either into this, into this um, uh, uh, extraordinary airport. Now let me tell you just a couple of facts about this place. So this is, one of, this is actually supposed to be the most dangerous airport in the world. The runway is built on the side of a hill. It goes down a hill, okay, really, really steeply. Just before this plane came on, a whole load of boys were playing football on the runway, and there was a cow, like, walking across, and a bloke with a stick goes and sort of beats the cow off the runway to try and get it uh, uh, a little bit safer. That plane is 40 years old, 4-0, okay? And uh, what happens is, it's the shortest runway in the world, and those are the white dots at the end. And watch how close to those white dots that plane gets when it takes off. But you know the most terrifying moment of all when you fly in and out of this airstrip, which is called Lukla, in the high uh, Himalayas, in the ball. The most terrifying moment of all is not when they throw a ton of luggage, then another ton of luggage, then even more luggage goes on. 
it's when the pilot, because you're sitting just behind the pilot, you can actually see him, there's no, he's not in the cockpit, he's in the same bit as you. The pilot reaches forward and he strokes his lucky rabbit's foot. <laughs> Seriously? And that is the moment where you think, get me off this plane, I've got to get out of here. The pilot is stroking his lucky charms before he takes off, and I'm not kidding. And that is the moment where you think, oh my goodness, can I actually go through with this? It is terrifying. So let's have a look and see what it's like to take off this place. <laughs> to trek um, up to base camp and that is about a three week journey uh, so let me show you a little clip uh, which will give you an idea of the first day the very first day of the trek up to base camp and this is how your journey begins okay so we're now crossing one of the main suspension bridges on the route to Everest base camp this is the major bridge going across the the river which has come from Everest itself and I'm following a porter in a typical mode <laughs> Right, you spotted the contrast Okay, you want to know about cult culture clash Have you ever heard, do you, do you know that expression culture clash? What does it mean, culture clash? What does it mean when we say there's a culture clash going on here? What do I mean by that? Anybody know? Have you, not, have you heard that expression before? A culture clash is when one culture um, has got a totally different perspective and viewpoint on life than another culture because of their circumstances and the circumstances of how they live. And this is a good example of that. Did you see the load that that guy has got on his back? I weigh 72 kilos here. I can guarantee you that guy is carrying between 80 and 100 kilos on his back. That's me plus you. It's me plus one of you that guy's going to have for 100 kilometers up a valley, up some very big hills, and he's going to be paid ten dollars a day. He's going to be paid a thousand yen for, for doing that. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. And, and that is what I call the culture clash. When you think, here comes a trekking group, these are Westerners coming back from base camp, how many kilos do you think they've got on their back? Maybe at the most, maybe five. Maybe they've got a glass of you know, a flask of water and a camera and a chocolate bar, literally. And so this is the reality of life in Nepal. It is a very uh, poor country. The people need work. They are desperate for money. And that guy is carrying a, a phenomenal load. Um, so that was the very first day of our, of our trek um, up to Beijing. Uh, and this is where you get these log jams on the bridges where it's difficult for these guys to pass because their loads are so huge. And that's the, the river that we're actually crossing here, the Kumbu River, melt water from the ice and snow of Everest itself. And so it's great to tick off these bridges because every single bridge we cross is a bridge that's closer, takes us closer to our objective of getting to Everest. Now it takes a long time to get up there, not just because of the, um, at the scale of the, of the landscape and so on, but you actually have to go very, um, uh, very slowly for another reason as well. Can anybody here guess what that reason might be? What's another reason to go slowly when you go up high to, to Mount Everest? Anybody know? Well done, yeah. What, what happens when you go to high altitude? What actually happens to your body? You get very, very sick. Um, let's have a look at uh, and what actually happened with our team was um, we, when we went up there this year. We had two members of the team that got altitude sickness. Now that means that the, the thin air is actually affecting your body in a very adverse way. It starts with a headache. Has anybody here ever had altitude sickness? Has anybody ever really been to Mount Fuji or above 2,000 meters? You may have felt it. You feel breathless, you feel a little bit headachy, and then when you get extreme altitude above five or six thousand meters, it actually becomes quite serious. You can get pulmonary edema, which means you have water on the lungs. 
you can have cerebral edema, which means water on the brain. And the only cure for it is to go down. And so we had two members of our team who were affected by altitude sickness and had to be taken back by helicopter. So let me show you a helicopter evacuation, and that will give you an idea of what it's like when things go wrong on Everest. Here we go. Both of these guys survived, by the way. They, they lived to tell the tale. But they had to get out. If they hadn't run down, it would have been dangerous. interesting fact about this is you have to pay the pilot in cash, $10,000 in cash. You won't take the credit card, no way, it's got to be a big pile of notes like that and that is um, one of the reasons why it costs so much to go to Mount Everest, it actually costs £50,000, uh, so it's a very expensive uh, business indeed to actually go there. Um, now this next uh, video uh, will show you what it's like to, um, uh, to meet some of the animals up there, the uh, famous yaks of the Himalayas. This one's been taking a little while to load. Let's have a, a little talk about it in between. And so it costs about $50,000 to climb Mount Everest. It's a very expensive project. And most people spend uh, about uh, 10 or 15 years of their lives planning and preparing. Here we go. Okay, so here we've got a... Yeah, we're trying to come down. Another example of the incredible loads that the, uh, the porters carry up there. So it is a fascinating journey. Uh, it's also a journey in which you meet some really amazing and bizarre characters. And this is one of the most extraordinary people I've ever met on the trek up to base camp. And uh, this gives you an idea of how eccentric some um, climbers and explorers can be. Here we go. You like this? This is really one of my favourite clips from this journey this year. Of the oxygen. We are just a couple of kilometers from Everest Base Camp, and if I'm not mistaken, I've just been passed by a, a man playing a guitar with a <laughs> So that was an amazing encounter. It turned out later that that man had been to the summit of Everest ten times in his life. He'd been there ten times, which is truly extraordinary. Um, this picture actually shows you something very important about the Himalayas, which is that above a certain altitude, above about 4,000 metres, it's a desert. The Himalayas is actually a desert. Nothing grows. Um, and uh, yet the mountains are covered in snow. Now, does anybody here know, what is the mechanism, the big 
meteorological system, the weather system, that actually is the reason why the Himalayas is actually covered in snow at high altitude. Do you know? Why is there so much snow in the Himalayas? What, what is the, the big weather system that causes that to happen? Does anybody hear that? It begins with M. Anybody know? It comes up from the Indian Ocean. It's the monsoon. Have you heard of the monsoon? Yeah? Okay, yeah. The monsoon is what causes all of the snow to fall in the Himalayas. So it's a very, very important weather system uh, which uh, is vital for the, um, for the Himalayas. Um, now, how do I get back to the... Thanks, you want to get back to your, your thing? Yeah, to the uh, power plant, yeah. Yeah, the power plant as well. So it's a fascinating place. And uh, the people that go there, you may ask, what type of people are attracted to going to Mount Everest? Well, the answer is um, people who love nature, people who love wilderness, uh, and people who um, enjoy testing their own limits and going out of their thanks, Mr. Great. Going out of their own comfort zone. What does it mean if we say we're going out of our comfort zone? What does that actually mean as a as a statement? Can you hear no? What do you think it means? Yes. They can do something that you're not used to doing. Yes, that's right. Something you're not used to doing. That's a good start. What else? What's another thing about going out of your comfort zone? It's something which tests, uh, tests your skills, doesn't it, in a way which may be challenging. Maybe you haven't even got the skills to do something, but you still want to try and do it. Yeah. What else is about the leaving your own comfort zone, do you think? Any other ideas? Having a little bit of um, courage would be an interesting part of it, wouldn't it? That you had to be perhaps a little bit courageous to try something, um, because you felt fear, and that is a very important thing. And one of the points I wanted to make about the um, expeditions that I've filmed and the journeys that I've made is that there are just as many very, very courageous and fantastic female climbers out there as there are men. I mean, they're, they're very, very challenging, have got ambitious ideas, courageous, focused on what their targets are. And did you know, for example, that the first woman to climb Mount Everest, do you know where that woman came from? Yes, she was Japanese, well done. She was Japanese, so a, a Japanese lady was the first person, a female, first female to climb Mount Everest, which is an incredible achievement. So you should be so proud of that. Sadly, she died last week. Uh, oh, really? Yeah, yeah. She died last week at the age of 75. She climbed it in the 1970s uh, and became the first woman ever to climb Mount Everest. An amazing achievement. Now, my, my journeys to Everest have, um, have really been wonderful, but at the same time very challenging. Did you know that Everest is rising? It's actually yeah. rising at the same speed that your fingernails are growing. Yes? Yeah. Why is Mount Everest rising? Does anybody here know? What would be the reason for that? Uh, yes? Yes, well done, okay. Um, two tectonic plates have collided 75 million years ago. And as they've collided, pushing against each other, they've forced the whole of the Himalayan mountain range to get higher and higher and higher. Now, that's good news if you love mountains, but it's also bad news if you want to live in that place. What would be one of the disadvantages of living on the border zone of two tectonic plates? You should know the answer to this one. Earthquakes, exactly. And did you hear about last year the earthquake in Nepal? Yes, did you hear about that? Terrible loss of life, 10,000 people, tragically, it's thought as many as 10,000 lost their lives in an earthquake in Nepal. Because unlike in Japan, where you have the technology and the like um, foresight to build um, earthquake proof houses in Nepal that does not exist. The, the villages in Nepal, for example, are more like this type of situation. Let me show you one of the villages, a typical village on the way to uh, Mount Everest base camp, and this will give you an idea. Um, let's see if I can find this. Yeah, this would be a good example. That's a typical village in Nepal, and um, the houses are built from wood and stone, and so it's very, very beautiful, but it's also a very um, wild and, uh, in many ways, uh, challenging environment to live in. Now, if you lived in this, um, this village, you'd be living in a place with no electricity, and with no running water, with no hospital, and no school. So it's a world very different to the world that we know, because it is in the uh, developing world. But that's the reality of the world that you are there now. And um, for us on our journey, um, there were some very important moments, and one of the most important moments 
is to realize that for the local people, Everest is actually sacred. It's actually the home of the gods. And it's very important that, that you have this ceremony called the puja ceremony, which many of you will know. And the puja ceremony is where you ask the gods for permission to enter their world, which is the world of Everest. And it's a wonderful ceremony. You uh, string prayer, prayer flags up, build up. That whole cairn there has been built by the Sherpa team that work with us on the, on the journey. And it's absolutely fantastic. And that um, gives everyone a good feeling because then the gods have been asked for permission and they've said yes, and we've um, uh, done the prayers and built the, the, the cairn. And um, that's an important part of the journey. It's actually just as important as the equipment and the, uh, uh, all the, the other stuff that goes with it. So um, it's fascinating to be up there. But you are very aware that you are in um, a dangerous place. And let me tell you one story from here. Now, in this picture, this is Everest Base Camp on the south side, the Nepalese side. I was here in April. And here you can see this great big glacier coming out of there. And um, the tents of Base Camp stretch from about here all the way down to about there. So you're actually living on the glacier, which means that it's creaking, groaning, cracking every moment of the day and night. It's actually moving. It's a river of ice coming out of the top zone. And you have to climb through that glacier to actually get up, even up to Camp 1. Now, last year, when the earthquake happened in Nepal, the whole of the Himalayas was shaken. In fact, Everest actually moved. That's Everest up there. There's a big triangle in the distance. The whole of the mountain was moved by one meter to the south. A whole, yes, it's incredible. A whole meter came towards the south. And there were some people camping here. You see that there? That's a hanging glacier. That means it's an unstable cliff of ice. And when the earthquake happened, it shook the whole of the Himalayan mountain range. A piece of ice the size of this whole school, the size of this school, fell off here, raced down that slope at 300 kilometers an hour. It was an avalanche of ice, and it hit the tents which were there, but now there's no tents, and it killed 22 people in, in the blink of an eye. And that was the direct result of the earthquake, causing an avalanche. Very unlucky, very unlucky. But it's another sign of how, what a raw environment, what an unstable environment that this actually is. Now for climbers, um, it's very important that we think about these things because we need to train, we need to practice, we need to you know, improve our skills. And one of the things I would say, um, if you ask me the question, how to become an adventurer, how to become a climber, the answer is to prepare and plan in really good detail. And that's true of every adventure and everything in your life, uh, because the important thing about having a dream is that um, a dream means nothing. A dream means nothing unless you have a plan. You need a dream plus a plan, okay? And if you've got a dream and a plan, you are always going to be a very successful person. I promise you that, because most people only have dreams. They don't have plans as well. So you need to train, you need to prepare, you need to be prepared to do hard work to achieve these dreams. And this is what we do. We go out onto the glacier. Uh, practicing for many, many days, and uh, you have to practice on the ladders as well. Crossing the ladders is very important. And uh, the reason for why it's difficult is because you have spikes on your feet, metal spikes, which are uh, very difficult to cross the ladders because of that. And uh, later on, uh, when you're actually on the, on the glacier, heading up into the, um, the higher part of the mountain, you find these incredible crevasses. And a crevasse, is basically, a crevasse is basically a crack in the ice. Ice is pliable. It's actually plastic. It moves and it can even go around corners as it moves slowly down. And that, that crack is getting bigger every day. But it, and then finally, if ice goes over a big drop, it cracks. It becomes uh, fragile and it opens up. And that is what happens there. And so you have to cross it on a, a ladder. And uh, my only advice to you would be, if you end up going to Mount Everest any time of your life, uh, in the footsteps of that courageous Japanese woman that became the first woman to climb it, don't look down. Because if you look down, you just look down, and that could be 200 meters deep. 200 meters. You're looking into the heart of the glacier. It's a terrifying moment. A really terrifying moment indeed. So, it's an extraordinary place. Now... <laughs> Now, uh, the other important thing 
The other important thing about, about climbing and adventure generally and the wilderness of the world is our, um, our ability to protect it, isn't it? And um, I have found on Everest, for example, this is our highest camp on Everest at 8,300 metres. There's a lot of rubbish. People have actually left junk behind. There's discarded oxygen bottles. There's hundreds of kilometres of rope, old rope, just lying around, just being left behind. There's actually dead bodies up there as well. There are many, many dead bodies. In fact, when we pitched our tent there, I took the photograph over here. This photograph was taken from here, looking that way. And then later, I walked across the ice, and I stood here and took another photograph. I thought, oh, that's a nice picture. And then I looked down at my feet, and there was the face of a dead climber. It was inside that old tent. Someone which had died, and then they put the tent around them, like a type of grave, because no helicopter can come near this place. It's impossible, because the air is too thin for the rotors to bite. No one will touch the body. They're too superstitious. And so the body was left. And we camped in that tent four metres away from the dead body. It was a really terrible, terrible life. Really frightening. Frightening. Now, to reach the actual summit, um, that is the summit ridge. That's um, a photograph I took of our lead Sherpa. We had Sherpas, people, helping us every inch of the way. We could not have climbed it without their help. And uh, we reached the top, and that was a great moment. And we had extra oxygen to help us to breathe. And you can see how the ice has collected on the front of my mask. Now, um, I mentioned that I do write books, and uh, we have um, a few books left which I'd be happy to sign for you. They are um, a thousand yen for each book. And um, if you want to know what they're like, you can ask for a reference from uh, the librarian who will give you a, a brief idea, um, rather than me blowing my own trumpet, as it were. We do have uh, also one copy, members of staff, uh, of my book, The Death Zone, which is the true story of my journey to Everest, if somebody wants an early Christmas present for themselves or someone. And I'll be happy to sign these books. If we run out of books, or you haven't got money here today, we're going to take orders and uh, we're going to get them shipped in in the next 48 hours, so we'll still get a public book. Okay, so that uh, concludes the session. If there are any questions at all, does anybody have any questions before we finish? Any questions? Anybody here going to climb Mount Everest? <laughs> no, quite right. You know what the thing is? Um, it is possible to do these things in a very safe way, if you think about it in the right way. That's the importance. Okay? Get some adventure in your life. So it's worth it. Thank you. So I'd just like to tell you, I know we have to rush a second, but I'd like to thank Matt for coming and sharing his story with you today. Absolutely, pleasure, yeah. And, uh, yeah, hopefully some of you will go out and now. What was this key piece of advice you gave you? Dream what you need up? Uh -huh.